began looking at new clean energy technologies over 10 years ago, but we still run cars on gasoline. Even if you can afford one of the new electric cars, it still plugs into the grid, which is run most in part by coal and nuclear. Since 2005, we have seen the BP Gulf disaster and the Fukushima meltdown. And fracking for cheap natural gas is destroying our natural water infrastructure in the process. Well-intentioned inventors have proposed a variety of fuel mileage improvements and other methods to power home and car. But nothing has been produced and caught the public attention close to the necessary magnitude of smartphones or any entertainment device. This program intends to go into details as to why we are no further ahead today than we were 10 years ago. Greetings listeners, my name is Ken Rasmus and I'm the host of the CommuteFaster.com webpage and the Commute Faster Energy Hour where we are discussing a variety of issues all related to energy. I have to raise the, the question today as we open with our first guest after a long five-year hiatus here, is why have all the great ideas in new clean energy not reached availability? Well, we've learned that we've got the same monopolies today that we had 10 years ago. Even the era we're finding that uh, everybody's telling us windmills are clean and they're not quite as clean as we thought they were, not as efficient. The late historian Anthony Sutton discovered the roots of the energy control problem that we're all facing today. So I want to bring on a good friend of mine, Les Pastor, who has done extensive study on the writings of Anthony Sutton and how various control paradigms are actually controlling the energy that we all have to use today. So uh, Les, uh, welcome to the show. And Thank you, Ken. Just want to hand the uh, the whole program over to you and tell us what you, what you've researched. Yes, Ken. I discovered Anthony C. Sutton's in 1972 at Seton Hall University via his, his books, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development. At the time, I was reading those two volumes. He was he was at the Hoover Institution writing Volume Three. I followed him most of my life, and he uncovered a significant control paradigm. It, it took his entire life and mine as well to uncover it, and uh, he ultimately uh, wrote a, a book first in uh, sections, then segments, uh, which ultimately became the final book called America's Secret Establishment, an introduction to the order of skull and bones. He said that the, the country was controlled by an elite establishment that controlled every aspect of that society, and he went on to elaborate. But what I'd like to talk about today is the fact that the, the discovering it was a complete shock to me. Reading Western technology and Soviet economic development, he apprised me that something was radically different from other than what I was being taught in school. I was fortunate in that I was never a structured thinker because I never stayed in any school system more than two years. So yeah, I was able to accept all kinds of ideas and uh, nothing was too radical to me. My initial foray into this whole business was my ability to recognize anomaly. And I questioned anomaly. Uh, in one of my philosophy classes at Seton Hall, I asked a question, since it, the subject matter came up, concerning revolutions. I said, how are revolutions caused? Uh, who funds them? And how are they maintained? Of course, every student turned around and looked at me in a puzzled, quizzical look. Everybody knew that back then, uh, at least they believed that revolutions were spontaneous. People didn't like what they had, and they threw it off and revolted. We know that's not true. There's only one revolution that I'm aware of. That indeed was spontaneous, and that was the 1956 revolution in Hungary, where the students uh, uh, were, were taught and trained to believe in the communist system, and they decided to challenge it, to find out if it was true. And when, when they realized that it was all a lie, they actually revolted. They actually were uh, displeased with the government of Im Imre Nudge, and yeah, he was forced to release Bela Kidai who was, became the gen, major general in charge of the revolution. And uh, that is very close to me because he was a friend of the family. He was a, a, an associate of my father's. They were both college professors. Kirai was teaching at Brooklyn College, and Dad was teaching at Seton Hall, and they would meet from time to time. Ultimately, Kirai went back to Hungary in the 1990s. He sat on the parliament, and uh, he ultimately uh, he, he died in Hungary. But the point is uh, that I'm making here is that the recognition of anomaly was the key. And I structured my research back then 
there was only one avenue to go, and that was the library, the university library. We didn't have PCs, you know, personal computers. We didn't have the Internet. There's no such thing as Google. So all we had were the textbooks that were available to us. And fortuitously, I was able to find one book in particular, or rather two. The first one I read was Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development from 1917 to 1930. And the reason why that book was important, because I discovered there were American corporations in Russia building the first, second, and third five-year plans. And among them was International Barnsdorf Corporation. And they were restructuring the oil fields in Baku enabling Russia to become the largest oil producer in the world, which enabled them to get real assets, real money, so that they could develop the country and and have hard, hard currency. Now, I found that fascinating because during that time period, this country was, was going, going through a major depression, and we had FDR controlling everything, and he was in power for four terms. And we were brought into a socialist-type system as well. So while we were struggling, we were suffering, we had American companies in Russia building them up and making them into a superpower. I essentially uh, was fascinated by all of this discovery, and I followed Sutton my entire life. He came up with additional books called Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, Wall Street and the Rise of FDR. He also wrote additional books called The Best Enemy Money Can Buy and National Suicide Military Aid to the Soviet Union, which he wrote during the Vietnam War, in which he showed that we had American companies that were actually uh, building uh, equipment that were used against our own troops in Vietnam. Now, that I found fascinating. It's difficult to discuss the subject matter in a brief period that we have today, so therefore I just want to touch upon a few key points. After reading everything that Sutton had provided, I wrote a thesis. And I said that what Sutton had provided showed me that there was going to be a takeover in the world involving monopoly power, world socialism, world economic interdependence. This book I gave, I brought with me to Regent University. I was invited by Carl Heitschu at the time to speak with Herb Titus, the founding dean of Regent University Law School. And I sat down with him in his uh, 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 office. He had a he had a, like a little tea room, an ante room. We sat down there, and it was a tea table. I turned the pages of the uh, of the thesis. It's, it's quite large. It's about a quarter of an inch thick. And I explained to him point by point what exactly transpired, what took place. the The front page was was my statement, and then I was uh, supporting it with quite a few uh, original primary source material. And as a result of that, uh, Herb Titus ordered all of Anthony Sutton's materials and books into the Regent University Library. When I came back to, to uh, from from uh, Virginia Beach, when I came back to New York, the next day, I called up Anthony Sutton for the first time in my life. Uh, in this was in 1999, and fortuitously, Marlena DePay as his secretary, she uh, picked up the phone. I've explained to her what I had done, how I admired uh, Dr. Sutton, and I basically wrote a thesis verifying his work using primary sources. And she was intrigued by that. She just handed the phone to Dr. Sutton. That never happened. Usually Sutton would only speak to uh, uh, the alphabet suit guys, uh, FBI, CIA, NSA, and uh, I guess MI5, MI6. They were, the FBI was intrigued with his uh, his work. In fact, it was the FBI who allowed him to continue his research at the Hoover Institution. Uh, that's another story. That should be done for another day. But I uh, received, as a result of that, he called it my April 26th package. He sent me two books. He sent me uh, two books that he had published, one on cold fusion, The Secret Energy Revolution by Anthony C. Sutton. And then he sent me a most, a very important book that really got me deep involved in technology called The View from Force Space. Uh, it was an FTE. IR publication of 1999, and he had auto autographed it. He said to Les Pastor, with warm regards from the author, Anthony C. Sutton, this was uh, written, inscribed uh, 61499. And as a result of that, uh, that particular book, reading it, uh, Dr. Sutton entertained me for, I would say, about four solid months via emails. And I retained these emails, and I used them 
in my uh, pages at the New Energy Congress on my profile page in which to to explain in detail uh, what I had uncovered. It's interesting that when I joined the NEC, most of those uh, people didn't even believe in conspiracy. They thought it was just conspiracy theory. Uh, theory. I had to show them that it was more than theory, it was fact. Indeed, the United States of America was founded by a conspiracy, a conspiracy of uh, Masons and Christians who collaborated to foment a complete break with the crown of England. And, of course, England didn't... Uh, didn't like that too much, and they sent troops over here. Essentially, uh, the issue was over money and taxation. The American colonials under Benjamin Franklin, they decided to issue their own money called scrip, and it was debt-free. They didn't have to borrow the money from any bank. They didn't have to uh, pay anybody back. Essentially, what they did was they issued the strip, they placed it in circulation, and they were able to uh, buy and sell, and they they basically had a medium of exchange debt-free that enabled them to function without any kind of uh, uh, let-up. The Brits didn't like this. The Bank of England didn't like this. So what they did was they imposed taxes upon the uh, colonies, and they, these taxes had to be paid in hard current, hard specie, gold, silver. That meant that the colonials had to work twice as hard because now they had to work to buy gold, uh, and they they had to produce even more. And they, they all they were doing was transferring this gold to the uh, crown of England, and as a result, you had a series of revolts. You had the Boston Tea Party. You had a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of revolutionary uh, uh, things that took place, primarily because they did not want to live under this kind of slavery, and uh, th they. Uh, succeeded. Uh, interestingly, they succeeded. They succeeded with the help of the French. Uh, uh, B uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, went to France specifically to, to get money, funds from the, from, 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 the royal, from the French king. He did it in a very interesting way. He went to the French salons. Uh, the ladies there, they liked him, and they were able to influence the king to lend the United States $13 million. And that was an astronomical sum in those days. And of course, they, with the aid of the, the French, uh, and they were able to basically stop the uh, the British uh, in, in key points, and uh, Masonic influence was heavily involved. This leads back to uh, my involvement with the New Energy Congress. I, after studying Anthony Sutton's uh, books on cold fusion and the view from force space, I began to realize that the entire uh, structure was controlled. Uh, they would not let any novelty of fact uh, enter into the uh, 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 dynamics of uh, techn technological uh, revolution. In fact, Sutton sent me a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, but, but written by Thomas S. Kuhn, and it was a fascinating book. It pinpointed the reason why we don't have advancement in technology, and it, it is a very simple methodology of control. Thomas Kuhn mentions it in Chapter 6. He says, Anomaly and the Emergence of Scientific Discovery. He says, Normal science does not aim at novelties of fact or theory, and when successful, finds none. What he's saying is that the the idea of anything novel does not even enter into the, uh, the concept of a scientific uh, inquiry. Uh, but he says, Nevertheless, new and unsuspected phenomena are repeatedly uncovered by scientific research, and radical new theories have again and again been invented by scientists. But the point is it's difficult, because you have a priesthood, a power structure, that does not want anything to deviate from what is considered to be the norm. And obviously, when someone has a, a control of a particular invention, they want to maintain that control. So obviously... The, the the problem was very acute and very real, and he, no one understood it except for Thomas S. Kuhn, in his, and he, he describes it quite well in his Structures of Scientific Revolution. Now let's go to Tesla. Tesla came to this country. He was rather naive. In 1884, he stepped off the boat onto our shores. He was only about three or four pennies in his pocket, but he he had a very interesting idea called the rotating magnetic field. Uh, he had designed it in his head. He had done it while he was in uh, in Hungary. Uh, he uh, talked to quite a few people, and one of them was Charles Batchelor, and, uh, and Charles Batchelor invited him to see Thomas Edison. Tesla worked for Thomas Edison briefly, 
when he discovered that Edison had no desire to deviate from direct current, which was funded by uh, J.P. Morgan. Edison having his own perspective on how he wanted to structure reality as he viewed it. Tesla left Edison, and he decided to develop his own system. Uh, interestingly enough, wherever Tesla went, he always improved the existing systems. Uh, he was able to uh, help others to uh, achieve success. In fact, many of his ideas uh, led and became multi-billion dollar enterprises in the future. <clears throat> I hadn't, uh, in other words, my, my understanding of all this did not come all at once. It came gradually. Uh, it came with understanding that the control paradigm permeated every aspect of life. And it uh, structured every aspect of life at the same time. Uh, Morgan ultimately had invested millions of dollars into Edison's work. And he had invested money into other areas. And he uh, realized that if he deviated to another paradigm, he would have lost his initial investment in uh, in direct current. And establishing the, uh, the grid system was quite rigorous. I mean, you had to invest in trees. You had to invest in copper. Uh, it, this was not a very simple task, and of course, all of this was brand new, novelty of fact. Edison really was using Faraday's methodology, the direct current, uh, but Tesla had long since surpassed Faraday and Maxwell. Tesla had studied Maxwell, and he discovered that Maxwell had, had already uh, created a, unified, a partial unified field theory that showed him that energy could be transmitted and could be extracted from a variety of methods and sources. Tesla wanted alternating current because he wanted to transmit the energy all over the Earth. And the best way to transmit it was using, utilizing alternating current. And he structured its uh, method and its methodology. I think he structured it at 60 hertz in the United States, and ultimately the Europeans used 50 hertz. We know today that we can use direct current uh, more effectively at a local level. So in other words, when energy is transmitted uh, long term via AC, it can be restructured into DC current and can be used at the local level. Do you have any questions again? Yeah, I should interject here. As you're, you're dropping some names here, Edison and Faraday and such, yep. Faraday was no fool, but right. he was limited by the instrumentation that was available at the time. He That's correct. didn't know any better than the instruments he had at the time. That was like late 1800s. Right. Uh, Tesla was brilliant enough to know in his mind far ahead of his own instrumentation. Tesla lived right. in the same time frame, but he was so far ahead of what the available instrumentation could handle. That's why he came up with such amazing stuff. And as as far as, as deals with uh, J.P. Morgan and Westinghouse, I'm sure you're, you're going to be getting into, yeah, a brilliant technical mind is not necessarily an intelligent business mind. And those are two different skills. And Tesla was brilliant in, in the electronic uh, engineering realm, but his actions kind of fell short and, and pushed him into a corner, and he got pinched between the bankers. And so let me hand it back to you as we as we go into the banker issue and how, how they are involved in, in controlling energy as a whole. Well, before we get that way, you may, you brought up a very interesting point, uh, and most people are not even aware of it. Prior to Tesla, there were no uh, electric motors uh, that were able to structure according to alternating current. Essentially, Tesla had to build his own. He had to build his own tool and die. He had to structure his own uh, motors, his own circuits, the whole nine yards. Nothing, it, in other words, it didn't pre exist. He had to do it from scratch. This is what people fail to understand and realize. Everything was an uphill battle for Tesla. And Tesla needed funding, uh, even back then, in order to do all that. He needed laboratories. In fact, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Tesla had five laboratories, and four of them mysteriously burned down. I would say that there probably would have been a little skullduggery there on the part of, uh, well, I, since I don't know, but there was, uh, there appears to have been skullduggery from some source because things just don't burn down. 
We don't know if it was Edison. We don't know if it was the Morgan groups. We don't know if it was uh, people who uh, wanted certain aspects of Tesla's technology and didn't want it to proceed, which is quite interesting. Uh, and Tesla had the uh, had the uh, uh, auspices of a Bell Labs, where he had unlimited funding. Who knows where we could have gone? Uh, oh, in fact, yeah. definitely. Let, let me interject a, a, sure. a short human interest story that, that shows you the the uh, the creativeness of, of inventors of, of his day and, and clear, even up in, into the 1950s. I had the opportunity to go to a um, a reunion on the, the the classic science fiction movie um, Forbidden Planet and got to meet a lot of the key not only actors but producers involved in it. One of the ladies who did the music track was uh, B.B. Barron. Anybody who watched that sci-fi, there was no music in it. It was just sound effects, and it was done with just various harm, harmonics and such. And I had the opportunity to talk to the lady. She was kind of up in years when I met her. Uh, and I said, well, did you just grab a Hewlett Packard tone generator and then pulse that in? And there was no Hewlett Packard in the 1950s. There was no uh, tone generators off the shelf. They had to invent it themselves. They were inventing the first electronic organs. And we go back to Tesla, and he, he comes up with a great design. Well, you need instrumentation to measure your design, and Tesla could do that. So yeah. that, that's a level of creativity that uh, is kind of disappearing anymore because everything has become so expensive to do. That's why bankers are kind of a necessity to get something out to market. So anyway, there was a, a level of ingenuity back in Tesla's day, especially with Tesla, that uh, it's it's just difficult to find of of having to invent the instrumentation to prove what it is that you're working on. So yes, anyway, uh, back here. Tesla yeah. was uh, in a unique position, but he was also in a, uh, a I would say a stymied position because he was only allowed to go so far. And even though he could prove what he, what he uh, was able to accomplish, the funds were not allotted to him because he was structuring the paradigm not for himself but for those that were investing in him. And they would only allow him to go so far as long as he proceeded according to the investor's paradigm. Uh, Tesla uh, wanted to go much further, and he uh, he was upset uh, continuously throughout his entire life by people who uh, were only interested in a very narrow view, whereas Tesla wanted to create a paradigm of free energy. He wanted to allow... Uh, the fruition of it, and that's why he did not develop any particular branch of his technological field. What he did was he pioneered, uh, I would say, many, many aspects of what we use today and take for granted. Uh, Tesla was only interested in showing people how to do things, and he was hoping that they would utilize his discoveries and proceed further. In fact, we know today that Tesla died penniless. Had he been allowed to uh, receive royalties from all of his discoveries and uh, ultimately inventions that flowed through his fertile mind, he would have lived quite comfortably and his heirs today would be fabulously wealthy. Unfortunately, Tesla was not able to uh, succeed in the business level, he wasn't interested in business per se. He, you have to understand, he came from the horse and buggy era. Uh, when he came to the United States in 1884, the wealthy establishment in New York City was still riding in horses and buggies. There were no automobiles. There were no aircraft. There was nothing. Everything was still agrarian. And the very wealthy, very elite, were riding uh, on horseback. And they were, they were riding in, in carriages. In fact, many of the tradespeople were, were pulling uh, uh, wagons uh, filled with their wares uh, with horses. In fact, I have a description of uh, New York City during that time frame, which is loaded with pictures uh, verifying that point. It's on my Nicholas Tesla page. So you have to be have to understand the perspective uh, that Tesla was uh, uh, coming from, and you have to understand the the nature of, of the. Uh, in the early stages of all of this. The, these were primary source uh, situations that he was establishing. He was the primary source. <laughs> uh, and uh, you mentioned uh, computers and whatnot. And what, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Tesla designed the first logic gates 
that were used uh, uh, primarily for robotics and were ultimately copied for computers. Uh, the entire computer industry is a, a particular uh, 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 anomaly. First, you had the Babbage machine. These were all mechanical machines. And they needed logic gates, and uh, they spent millions and millions of dollars on all of this, and then it was scrapped. And then they went to other areas, and then it was scrapped. Then, of course, they went to mainframes, and, of course, they still use mainframes. Use, they still have Fortran, COBOL. But the point is that we now are able to do most of these things and take our life for granted, and it all derived from Tesla's fertile mindset. He he looked at the world totally differently than uh, than uh, people today. I, I would give as an example uh, uh, Stephen Jobs. Stephen Jobs uh, looked at the world differently and said we can we can develop PCs. Uh, we can develop machinery that will enable the common man to be able to utilize information just like uh, the elite use uh, with their mainframes and and their software and. Uh, Essentially, two individuals uh, succeeded in doing that, and I might add, they created new new uh, forms of wealth in the process. So this business where you have a zero-sum uh, game where all the marbles have to be gathered into one space and everybody is deprived of those marbles is false. You can create new forms of wealth. Uh, you can create new forms of technology. You don't have to steal from Peter to pay Paul. You can create value, create worth, and restructure life to enable uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, prosperity to a whole group of people uh, based on your uh, your novelty of fact and your 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 discoveries and this was this is exemplified by silicon valley silicon valley did not exist prior to uh, jobs and, and gates and, and and the people that invented the uh, circuits and whatnot and prior to uh, the, uh, the the founding of uh, google and the internet I mean, all of this uh, happened piecemeal, uh, but it all fit together. It all came together, and uh, we had a new technology, new industry. And I might add that all of it is governed, as you said before, and I agree, through the uh, financial system, the, 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 uh, the, the real power brokers. Unfortunately, uh, money and invention uh, are at loggerheads with each other. Money wants to make profits immediately. Money wants to control everything. And money wants to speed up everything. And if it doesn't get what it wants, it triggers a default. Because uh, money doesn't move at the same pace as inventors or structured, uh, yeah. structured environments. And speaking from my own stock for Rebecca Brown, everybody wants to maximize profits at every step of growth, and that's impossible. You have to have a growth stage. You have to have R&D stages. You have to have stages of development. Some are right, all cycle. cash out. Some are cash in. Uh, so, Les, we're, we're down to the last 30 seconds of the show here. If you could uh, just give our, our listeners a brief summary of, of uh, some of the topics you tend to go to and you know, go into in uh, future episodes. Yes, I intend to discuss the anomaly. I have a brief outline. I recognize the anomaly. I did research and discovery. I realized there's a, a factuality to the reality of that information. And then I, you have associations and relationships. You have structured thinking versus observation and perception. And then our educational belief structures are structures are normal perception. I think the Bible says, train up a child the way he will go, and he will not deviate from it. I recognized what the problem was, and I realized it was complicated, and it is, it is complex and therefore has to be discussed piecemeal so that people can bite, take little nibbles of it and chew it and digest it until they can understand it. Uh, after a while, after all, it took me a lifetime to also discern the truth. Very good. Okay, well, you were, we've run out of time here. We need to close off. But for past listeners with me, they might think I'm taking an academic turn from my normal shows in the past. But uh, I need to let everyone know I do have issues with academia. I have no issues with true scholarship. And there is a kind of a difference in those two words. And what we're talking over with, with Les here is true scholarship of digging into the books that document the truth behind the story. And that's why we're going to be doing a few a few additional episodes here on this. So I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in today. And hopefully we should be uh, coming on next week, same time, same station. Thank you much. Bye for now.
We began looking at new clean energy technologies over 10 years ago, but we still run cars on gasoline. Even if you can afford one of the new electric cars, it still plugs into the grid, which is run most in part by coal and nuclear. Since 2005, we have seen the BP Gulf disaster and the Fukushima meltdown. And fracking for cheap natural gas is destroying our natural water infrastructure in the process. Well-intentioned inventors have proposed a variety of fuel mileage improvements and other methods to power home and car. But nothing has been produced and caught the public attention close to the necessary magnitude of smartphones or any entertainment device. This program intends to go into details as to why we are no further ahead today than we were 10 years ago. Welcome back to part two of a series on the control paradigm that was identified by the late uh, Anthony Sutton uh, that controls uh, just about everything that we do today. Our researcher is Les Pastor. Last week, we touched on the well-known problem of the banker J.P. Morgan and his dealings with both Tesla and Edison. I closed out last week's uh, show stressing the difference between academics and scholarship. This week, Les goes into further details that Anthony Sutton had uncovered that control the types of energy that we use today. So let's uh, take it over. Yes, before I uh, go into that, I want to read two uh, emails that I, I wrote concerning Sutton uh, that are very important and significant to the uh, listener. Uh, this was uh, written April 8, 2002. Ever since my university days, I had known that the information I was receiving was incomplete and sometimes deliberately inaccurate. Having had an opportunity to study in the European school system during the early 60s and then returning to the American school system, I realized that there was a significant dichotomy with regard to the differing approaches to achieving a significant knowledge base. But I was unable to accurately pinpoint the deception until I discovered it, Dr. Anthony C. Sutton's monumental works from the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, California. As a youngster, I used to read, spend time in my father's library reading from, about Russia and East Central Europe. During my time in his library reading, I noticed that there were significant gaps in information relative to the revolutionary period uh, from 1916 to 1922. So when I attended the university, I began to ask the kind of questions that are necessary but irritating to the gatekeepers. How do revolutions start? Why do revolutions start? How are revolutions funded? Who provides the logistics and maintenance of a revolution? And lastly, what is the end result of a revolution? Dr. Sutton answered those questions quite nicely. But his answers provided more questions requiring more research until a faint picture emerged that was not at all coherent with the established and accepted dogma being purported as established fact. So in 1999, I contacted Dr. Sutton via email and began to entertain a series of inquiries with regard to his ongoing work. By this time, he had already progressed into the sciences and physics with his monumental view from force space, thrust into the new paradigm of force space technologies. I presented him with my personal research, which he accepted, acknowledged, and graciously graded with an A. I essentially agreed and verified his assessments as being basically true. You can view his books and materials at, at his former website, which probably doesn't exist anymore. There you will be able to acquire some of his books and newsletters. Dr. Sutton is very, very thorough and very informative. As pertaining our education demise, you will learn how outcome-based education has deliberately made fools of us all and deliberate idiots of most, most of our children. It is a crime against humanity and a confiscatory rape of our hard-earned monies and theft of our children's, of our futures. We are witnessing the total destruction of the Western conceptualization of life with return replacement of a feudal servitude based on ignorance and fear-mongering. Is there a rhyme or reason, plan or purpose to this activity of deception? You be the judge by asking the right questions, especially if you want the right answers to those questions. Go to Google and ask the right questions in the form of search items and study what you find. You might learn something significant. On the following month, on May 13, 2002, I wrote an additional email, and here's what I said. I guess by now you're wondering why I keep quoting and deferring to Dr. Anthony C. Sutton, who has a very interesting website, and why I rely on his knowledge base. The answer is as simple as it gets, integrity. 
When I was a college student back in 1972, he suddenly answered some basic questions that no one else was able to or had the guts to explain. I did not accept the drivel that was being taught, and I openly challenged and irritated my professors because I knew instinctively that there was a problem with the purported facts as they were given to us. The facts simply didn't fit, and the questions went unanswered. Thankfully, Dr. Anthony C. Sutton himself was busily, openly challenging the historical paradigm. His was a loftier goal of setting the official record straight, and to his eternal credit, he had the guts to proceed and broke through the gates of the gatekeepers. When his efforts were interrupted by academia, Dr. Sutton proceeded to Regnery Press, surprising Henry Regnery of the nature of the problem. Henry redirected Sutton to the Uber Institution at Stanford University, where he delivered his first manuscript, Western Technology and Soviet Economic Development, 1917 to 1930. A significant masterstroke of data, verifying that it was the West that created the Soviet Union, and in his subsequent forthcoming Volume 2 and Volume 3, to find the true nature of the Russian control paradigm. Dr. Sutton caught the eye of the Assistant Director of Domestic Intelligence, FBI, Alan Belmont, who had just recently retired and fortuitously happened to receive Dr. Sutton's manuscript when it crossed his desk at the Hoover Institution. Belmont consulted Soviet emigres regarding Dr. Sutton's findings, and upon discovery of their veracity, immediately consulted Hoover at FBI, who initiated Operation Solo to the chagrin of the Kremlin. This country owes this marvelous gentleman, Dr. Anthony C. Sutton, a brief moment of praise and thanks for his profound insights and significant work for exposing the reality and true nature of the control paradigm matrix. Dr. Sutton continued his research and furthered his publications by writing National Suicide Military Aid to the Soviet Union, whereupon he was summarily ejected from the Hoover Institution because now he was openly challenging the government of the United States. Fearlessly and unequivocally, he continued now completely on his own to solve the mystery that skillfully evaded his grasp, knowing that the answers would deepen and broaden the search for truth in areas that brought him seemingly towards imponderable directions. First, he began to analyze Wall Street's role in building the Soviet Union, openly questioning the integrity of our leaders and government officials by writing Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution, Wall Street and the rise of Hitler, and Wall Street and FDR which eventually brought him to the attention of the secret power structure, the Russell Trust Association, by way of a clandestine loan of the secret list of names in this ultra-secret society. Because of Dr. Sutton's skillful and scholarly approach in researching the puzzle box paradigm of control, he was able to piece together the remaining threads in the fabric of this intricate matrix. And so he wrote the book first in sections, as segments, and then collectively together in one bound volume, recently updated and modernized as America's secret establishment. True to form, Dr. Sutton continued this research into the mystery of the control paradigm by examining hidden aspects of the nature of technology and how technology was deliberately subverted and again placed within the control matrix. His next volume, The View from Force Space, was an eye-opener, revealing segments of technical data deliberately suppressed because it would justify a challenge to the existing, established, governmentally sanctioned scientific community. It was through Dr. Sutton that this writer, myself, was personally apprised of the uh, new scientific fourth-dimensional technologies that loom soon within our reach, a reach, I might add, that will someday propel all of us, some through our children and grandchildren, into a very interesting future, a future that Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, and Nikola Tesla tried to give us a long time ago, but were prevented by the control paradigm matrix. And I sign it. Now, that's, the, the, those are two very important emails that I uh, presented, and they were captured by other people and put on their uh, websites. The reason why it's important is because a month after that second email that I wrote, Anthony Sutton mysteriously died. Uh, Marlena heard him get up around 5 o'clock, and then there was a hard thump when he fell to the a floor. Now, whether he died of a, a natural causes, heart attack, or he was uh, murdered via a, a Venus shooter, I don't know. Uh, but Or an induced heart attack induced, I don't know. There's no way to prove it, no way to verify it. But I do, I do find it suspicious that he was uh, silenced because it was well known by the intelligence community that he and I were communicating. 
uh, obviously, because I was using AT&T uh, uh, as an email conduit. But in any event, uh, he is significant because he significantly showed uh, and with verifiable proof that there was a control paradigm and that it was prevalent and prominent. Uh, let me read from his book, his actual book, The View from uh, Fort Space. This is from page 55. At UCLA, we were ejected from the doctoral program. A sympathetic member of the department, Dr. Dudley Pegram, found a position for this author at uh, California State University of Los Angeles as assistant professor of economics. At Cal State, we encountered the same hostility and viewpoint. Soviets have their own self-developed technology. Everyone knows that. But we survived five years before denial of tenure. However, quietly, we began in 1965 a massive self-financed study, a technical analysis of Soviet industry. For five years, we said little and completed the first volume of the three-volume study. The data were not difficult to obtain. The, the Soviets had convinced themselves that they had a self-generated indigenous technology, and the Glavlet sensors allowed export of numerous training and equipment manuals and handbooks under the mistaken impression that they were needed to maintain Soviet exports of this equipment. These manuals were undeniably evidence of uh, dependence uh, when compared to, Soviet, to Western uh, models and designs. Then came one of those fortuitous events that cannot be explained, but broke the barrier of orthodoxy. We sent the manuscript unsolicited to Henry Regnery Company in Chicago. Two weeks later, we had a return letter from Henry Regnery himself to effect that the work was very important but not commercial. Regnery advised we send the manuscript to Hoover Institution at Stanford University, again by accident. The manuscript arrived at the desk of Alan Belmont, Assistant Director for Administration at Hoover Institution, and the one man in the entire United States best able to judge its accuracy. Belmont had just retired to Hoover from FBI, where he was Assistant Director for Domestic Intelligence, and knew firsthand the efforts by the Soviets to acquire U.S. technology through espionage. Belmont sent the manuscript to emigre Russian engineers, those who had worked in the Soviet plants using the technology we described. This route was probably the only way the manuscript could break through the paradigm barrier. This was the breakthrough that Bruce De Palma never found. Pons and Fleischmann had to go to France with Japanese financing to work on their novelty effect, as Kuhn described the barrier phenomena. Yul Brown, discussed below, found acceptance and award in Australia, but rejection in the United States. By 1968, we were at Hoover Institution working in the, on the remaining two volumes. All three were published between 1968 and 1974 without major struggles uh, within Hoover Institution, notably with hostility from former CIA personnel. By the end of 1974, we had three volumes in print, but the fourth volume on military aspects led to expulsion from Hoover Institution and a battle led by CIA personnel trying to cover the tracks of inadequate analysis in official Washington. The fourth volume surfaced the military assistance provided by the technical transfers and which were not suspected at all in Washington. We did not know at the time that these volumes had also surfaced the so-called perceptions problem, that U.S. intelligence had been suckered by Soviet propaganda. The CIA wanted the military implications concealed to protect their image. This, this author was the unfortunate messenger. That's Anthony Sutton. The Soviet collapsed within 20 years, and the world now knows that the system was a technological hoax and an economic disaster. Okay, I thought it was important to bring that out, because most people will never read that, never know it, never understand it. It was an eye-opener to me, and it steered my uh, focus down a path that I never would have gone had he not sent me these two books, that book in particular. And now getting back to the monetary system, uh, which is the interesting focus on uh, also a control paradigm matrix. I came across a few books concerning the uh, Federal Reserve, but none of it made sense. They were all considered to be conspiracy theory, and I basically rejected them until I uh, came across a book called The Federal Reserve and Our Manipulated Dollar by Martin A. Larson. When I read that book, I realized that Larson was onto something. 
uh, he showed that there was indeed a conspiracy. Uh, it had taken place on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. And uh, in my younger days, I actually took a trip down to uh, G- Georgia, actually Florida. I came back from Florida. I stopped off at uh, Georgia uh, on Jekyll Island, and uh, I visited the place. It was actually, at that time, owned by 200 of the wealthiest families in the United States. They had cottages on that island that were bigger than most estates uh, on Long Island. <laughs> and uh, uh, to say the least, uh, I was very impressed with uh, with the surroundings. And uh, it was it was an opulent place for, for these people. And it was there that they had holed up for several weeks and uh, created the uh, Federal Reserve System on paper. Paul Warburg was the key point man in it and he created the Federal Reserve from scratch. Now, the first person to write about the Federal Reserve was Eustace Mullins. Mullins never intended to do any of this. He was invited by a friend to visit uh, an interesting gentleman at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, an insane asylum uh, for the criminally insane in, in Washington at the time. And it was there that Ezra Pound was incarcerated by uh, the FDR administration for his uh, pronouncements on Italian radio concerning uh, his desire for the United States and Europe to stop the, the war. He, he viewed it as as something that should not be done and that he knew that millions of people would die. Of course, most people have to realize that Ezra Pound came from a different era, the horse and buggy era. Things were a lot uh, gentler and simpler uh, during that time. He was essentially a poet. His perspective was to help others who were in the field to get published. And among them were authors who are considered important today, T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, Ernest Hemingway, significant. In fact, it was Ernest Hemingway who helped uh, to get uh, Ezra Pound out of uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in uh, Washington, D.C. But interestingly enough, Overholzer, the uh, doctor at uh, that was in charge of that hospital, uh, actually took a shine to uh, to uh, Ezra Pound and made life much easier for him by taking him out of the criminal ward and putting him into nicer surroundings where he was able to meet with uh, friends and uh, people who were interested in talking to him. If you look at his book, uh, This Difficult Individual Ezra Pound, which you can read online, by the way, which was published by uh, uh, Eustace Mullins, uh, about Ezra Pound, you will understand uh, the nature and the conditions that were involved at that time. It was at Elizabeth Hospital that Mullins was authorized to research the Federal Reserve. In fact, Ezra Pound was curious about it, and he would have done it himself except for his incarceration. So what what Mullins did was he would, he would go to the uh, Library of Congress, and he would do the research, and then he would discuss it. And he would explain his findings. He did it with George Simpson, and they would talk about how it was started. And the subject matter was very intriguing for him, so that he decided to uh, go further. When he attempted to publish, he was stopped. He was prevented by uh, publishers. Uh, they didn't want to get involved. Uh, a book was secretly published in Germany, and it was burnt. The subject matter became so difficult that... Most publishers considered it a hot potato and just basically stopped it. So it was not until uh, the Federal Reserve and our manipulated dollar by uh, re- published by Devin Adair and uh, uh, written by Martin A. Larson that the information started to get out. The complexity of this book, even though it was written in simplified terms, was so against the mainstream that it required my own due diligence and my own research. Fortunately, uh, I was able to... Uh, find primary source information at Seton Hall University that basically verified the conspiracy. And that was of key importance to me, because had I not found it, I would not have been able to continue uh, the research, and I would have dismissed all of it out of hand. And uh, it was significant because in the library I found the actual published book uh, written by uh, uh, Paul Marks Warburg concerning the Fed in which he essentially confirms that the conspir- that a conspiracy did uh, take place. And he affirms it by uh, 
writing a superscription to his friend and associate, Frank K. Vandalip. Vandalip uh, actually revealed the nature of the conspiracy in his book, From Farm Boy to Financier. The superscription that I came across inside the uh, uh, stated, as a souvenir of common efforts in years gone by, this book is presented to Frankie Vandalip with the compliments of Paul M. Warburg. And it's written in his signature, and I know his signature because I saw his signature on the incorporation papers of the Council on Foreign Relations when it was founded. He was one of the incorporators. So when I when I discovered that, I realized I I had to find a gold mine in terms of linkage. Here were two people who were linked directly to the Jekyll Island event, who were communicating with each other via this book. And in it, he described exactly what the Fed was. And so, and I decided that this information was so important that I would put it in my research papers at the New Energy Congress. Fortunately, you can buy these books, but you can also read them online. The Secrets of the Federal Reserve uh, by uh, Mullins can actually be read online right now. And you can also read uh, Sutton's uh, the Federal Reserve Conspiracy online, so you don't have to if you can't buy them, they're not available, you can read them online. I provided some of this information on my front page, uh, my profile page, called the Mullins on the Federal Reserve. This difficult individual, Ezra Pound, used this Mullins. It's a general link, Google link. The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. Actually, Ezra Pound, typical individual, it was published in 1961. Secrets of the Federal Reserve in 1963. The Federal Reserve and Our Manipulated Dollar was published in 1975. The War on Gold is 1977 by Anthony Sutton. Uh, the Federal Reserve Conspiracy in 1995, and those three links are actually uh, links that you can read by Anthony Sutton. And The Creature from Jekyll Island in 1994, and first by G. Edward Griffin. Unless you read these books, you will not understand what is being discussed by me today. You must do some significant due diligence on your own. Understand the background material that is involved. And then, once you have been fully acclimated and immersed in the knowledge base, then you will begin to understand why I did the things that I did. I had to prove that conspiracy was real. I had to prove why the conspiracy uh, took place. And it's still ongoing. Even to this day, it's getting even worse. Do you have any questions? Yeah, if I can jump back a, a few points here, we should also take a look at uh, as these various events take place, uh, such as Anthony Sutton's death. I just had to look up on Wikipedia here. He died on June 17, 2002. That was obviously during the Bush administration, Bush II, yep. which uh, everybody now knows was joined at the hip with the oil industry. Yep. So as, as far as coincidences, yeah, there are coincidences. But uh, you mentioned uh, the possibility of Anthony's personal correspondence being monitored. Uh, today, we're, we're doing this show on uh, uh, February 25th, uh, 2014, and uh, the big fellow's name in the news now, Whistleblower, is, of course, uh, Edward Snowden. He hasn't revealed much new to those of us who have been paying attention over the last few years. Uh, we had Project Echelon and, and several other things start over 10 years ago that was already monitoring everybody's email and phone calls. And granted, the NSA has gotten plenty of money all through executive order, by the way. NSA doesn't even exist legally by Congress. It came into existence by executive order. And they've gotten plenty of money to uh, to do everything they're doing, which uh, now is monitoring emails and logging everything in. And amazing how much they love to monitor private individuals. But when a major retailer like Target or Neiman Marcus or, or several other really big names get hacked, uh, NSA doesn't seem to have a clue of who did the hacking on that. And when you find other major Internet crimes going on, NSA doesn't have a clue who did it. How interesting. So, well, yeah, conspiracies are most definitely real, and anybody who denies it is they are the real deniers. And it, the, the, you wonder if they even have a life. Uh, it, it, what what it, will they pay attention to? And then we, we look back, and I'm sure you'll be going into the uh, Bush's ties up through his family line, Prescott Bush and, and Prescott financing the Nazis. 
that family loves to control populations by fear. Well, and uh, I I couldn't believe it. My, my brother's an intelligent guy, but when George Bush set up in front of the TV cameras and announced the creation of Department of Homeland Security, I remarked to my brother and said, that's a German expression. And he didn't know that. And that's the American population apparently slept through junior high civics class. Department of Homeland Security, that is a German expression right out of Nazi Germany. And uh, and yet that is now controlling TSA and uh, sticking the hands down your pants when you try to uh, take a trip on an airplane. This is uh, atrocious. And we can thank George Bush and uh, and his buddy Dick Cheney for starting that. Well, let, uh, let me use that as an interesting segue here because uh, this is something that most people are not aware of. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I wrote a page at the NEC called, Is Your Voting Process Secure and Legitimate? Now, most people are not even aware of it. Uh, there, was a com there was a computer programmer, Clint Curtis. Uh, he was went before Congress, and he, he told them, he said, voting machines can be altered. Now, prior to him, there was another lady, uh, Bev Harris, in which she, wrote a, she presented a piece called Hacking Democracy. And it was out there until it was uh, basically suppressed. Now, these, those two individuals revealed that the votes were actually controlled. They were actually suppressing a support. Now, let me read directly from the piece so you can understand what's going on here. Okay. The Clint Curtis story is a documentary that should perk the interest of everyone, Democrat, Republican, Independent, and Tea Party alike. It is the story of corruption, deception, and a political malignancy that permeates all of the political parties. George W. Bush and John Kerry were both secret members of the Russell Trust Association, Skull and Bones, from Yale University. They were members of a secret brotherhood and a secret agenda to help one another common goals and to arrive at similar objectives clandestinely, unobtrusively, covertly, and by the stealthiest of means possible. Clint Curtis revealed that he was instructed to write code for Tom Feeney, Speaker of the House of Florida, that would flip the vote via a clandestine source code. He accomplished the task and then discovered that this was not an exercise to prevent fraud, but an actual exercise which would commit fraud, enabling the perpetrators to switch the votes in their favor and thus win the election. Debold machines were then installed at voting booths having these same source codes embedded within them enabling the clandestine switching of the vote within closely held parameters, thus precluding a trigger for an automatic vote recount. Those conducting exit polls became concerned when it was discovered that the exit poll count differed, differed from the debold uh, tallied vote. The conclusion? Something was radically wrong, or there was a significant defect or a deliberate covert act switching the votes along a 51-49 split in favor of a clandestinely desired candidate. The evidence was unmistakable but remained refutable due to the political intervention on behalf of the challenged candidate. Mr. Curtis threatened, his dog killed, politically maligned, and ostracized, still maintained his composure and his resolve to forward this information to the U.S. Congress of the United States. So, what I'm getting here is this. From now on, we can no longer trust our elections if they're done through electronic means. The votes can be switched. We do not know if we have honest voting anymore. And this was first done, first recognized by Bev Harris in her black box voting uh, system. She realized that the votes were actually uh, not counted. They were thrown in the trash. And she found them. She actually did the research and found that votes that were not counted were found in the trash. And she, a documentary was written about that. And so you can see uh, uh, I'm not supporting either side or e either political party. I'm showing that the votes are now deliberately uh, hidden, uh, destroyed, and they're not counted correctly and accurately so that our political process is now secretly controlled, and the American people have no voice in it. 
And uh, that's why I wrote the, the page, is your voting process secure and legitimate? I don't tell people how to think, how to vote. I tell them that this is what's going on, and this is how you can uh, solve the problem. Once, once you understand this problem and the nature of the problem, now you can go about and solve it and resolve it appropriately. And I, I have lots of information on that page. I actually have a video uh, with him before Congress revealing all this. And, of course, Mr. Curtis uh, received a tremendous amount of heat as a result of it. Uh, he was sued. I believe he, uh, he went uh, continuing education. I think he became an attorney. Uh, he realized that he had an uphill battle here to basically uh, solve the problem. Any any other questions, Ken? If I need to, to, to summarize, uh, some comedian compared the White House to the to the phrase the big house. And the big house and old gangster movies referred to going to federal prison. Okay. Uh, it should be. Uh, we've had a parade of criminals for the last hundred years going through the White House, and uh, nobody was innocent. I confess to uh, at one time being a registered Republican. Uh, they lied to me, something royal. When I saw George Bush, who campaigned on a pro-life platform, increase funding to Planned Parenthood. That proved to me he was a total fraud. I, I, I can't put up with that. Being a registered voter just means you uh, you agree to buy into their system, and this is what we're, we're going into here. Those are the characters that we have marching through the White House. What we're doing here is... No, we're not passing on conspiracy theories of, of stuff that we've picked up uh, off the Internet. Uh, Les has really dug into books of research here, and Les has the discernment to identify crazy rumors versus uh, what actually happened. And so yeah, this is I, what we're going into. If I hadn't yeah. found the information other than what I first uh, came across, I would have just discarded the whole business and, and just lived a normal life. Uh, life never remained normal for me once I discovered that uh, it was a serious problem and it needed to be understood clearly before I could provide the information to others. Because unless one clearly understands uh, what they're dealing with, the nature of it, uh, they really can't uh, transmit and transfer that information and knowledge to other people. Uh, hopefully, I mean, what I'm interested in is other people uh, taking the information and digging deeper, uh, getting more information, having a, ri a richer knowledge to it. So I, that's why some of the pages I, I did not copyright, because I wanted other people to go further, to uh, look at the due diligence and uh, and do it. And uh, fortunately, uh, uh, one man did, uh, G. Edward Griffin, in his uh, monumental book, The uh, the Creature from Jekyll Island. Uh, I read it. Uh, I was impressed with it. Uh, for me, it was a simplification uh, of my work. And uh, I essentially uh, agree with him wholeheartedly and everything he, he says in it. And uh, it would take too long to, to go through the book and, and discuss it in detail. That's why I have the page, The Creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve, written and discussed by G.A. Wood Griffin. The man has done a superb job. He has skillfully provided all of the additional information that was necessary to corroborate the work of others before him. He simplified what I tried to present in my thesis, and for that I'm uh, grateful. I found it interesting uh, that Sutton divulged information to, to various people and he only, as it turns out, you you would have to go to other people, other books, in order to piece everything that he said together. The uh, fleshing out uh, skull and bones investigations into America's most powerful secret society is an interesting book. Because it reveals aspects of Sutton that are not revealed elsewhere. And I wholeheartedly suggest that people get the book uh, because most of these books are self-published. And these books are not readily available except through uh, outlets that they uh, provide. Uh, in in his case, it's trinday.com, T-R-I-N-E-D-A-Y.com. And uh, I believe he has a, a, a telephone link where you can talk to him directly. Uh, he has a picture of his father holding uh, some sort of a, uh, a skeleton, uh, Lloyd Sidney Milligan. Uh, from who lived from uh, uh, August 18th to 1918, uh, February 7th, 1990. And he says the picture was taken in Indonesia in 1951, the year of my birth. The information is quite revealing. The book 
uh, provides a lot of information that you will not get elsewhere. I had to do my own due diligence. I had to visit uh, Tom Bearden at his home in Huntsville, Alabama. I had to sit down with him and uh, listen to his explanation because three of the uh, MEG prototypes that were built at huge costs were actually promptly destroyed by engineers who were uh, sent in to look at the uh, device by wealthy individuals, wealthy uh, investors. And these engineers looking at it said, ah, it's it's nothing but a transformer. Ridiculous. So guess what? They handled it like a transformer and destroyed it. They didn't understand the Arana bomb effect. They didn't understand broken symmetry. They didn't understand Maxwell's original equations, which were actually painstakingly put together by Maxwell after he listened to a discussion that he heard uh, from uh, uh, Faraday at the at the Royal Institution. Maxwell listened probably to several of uh, Faraday's uh, lectures, and after listening to them carefully, he went back to his estate at Glen Lair. He was independently wealthy, uh, and he had tremendous leisure time. And he pulled up in on his estate for six years, six long years, writing out his equations in, in quaternion format. The problem is, is that the vectorists, they're actually known as Maxwellians and they're not, uh, Heaviside, Gibbs, and Tate looked at those equations and couldn't understand them and attempted to simplify them. The problem is that in simplifying them and reducing them to vector equations, they lost the scalar component of the uh, quaternion uh, equations, and they reduced a, a significant segment of them so that they have, bear no recognition to what they originally were. Unfortunately for them and fortunately for us, if you take all uh, 20 of the known variables and 20 of the unknown variables and you put them into a computer simulation program that is able to uh, – view quaternion constructs, you can see exactly what Maxwell intended. Uh, Essentially, what Maxwell revealed was that the construct of the creation has a physical component and a non-physical component, and that most of the control aspect of what you see in nature is actually controlled by things that you don't see in nature. And this, of course, was subsequently uh, verified by Dirac and the uh, quantum mechanics engineers, and they essentially were revealing to us at the Solve conferences, S-O-L-V-A-Y, that this was a a new paradigm, a new understanding, and should be funded, financed, so they could be understood uh, from a physics point of view. In other words, before you can do anything electronically or understand the electronics of any invention, you must understand its its physics application, why it came together, how it came together. The problem is that most students don't ask the right questions. They're born into a system that they know nothing about, and they accept it at face value without asking questions. That's not what I did. Kid, I asked, where did the technology come from? Where did pants come from? Where did uh, electricity come from? Where did TVs come from? Nobody asks these questions, and these are very important questions to understand the truth, the reality of what you're, 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 you're encompassing, what you're living through. In any event, I did that, and with the help of Sutton, I was able to uh, understand the full implications of what, uh, what we found. Let's see now. Today, according to our sources, Morgan Stanley is preparing the IMO for black light power uh, proven free energy. The re- reason why that's important because I uncovered the fact that uh, Black Light Power was providing proof of their process in a video. I had it up for a few days. I'll just go back to my documented news and information site, which anybody can Google, and they'll see that the information uh, reveals. Uh, the video. Yeah, I should interject here briefly. Uh, Eustace Mullins passed away in February 2010. Yep. There's still a lot of his information uh, still on the internet, though, and and well worth uh, looking up and, and compiling on on one's own. I know on my commute faster energy page, if you dig back into historical events that are relevant today, he column. Uh, I have an, an entire write up that uh, Eustace did on the on the Manhattan Project, and my gracious, if that isn't an eye-opener. Few people even know what 
the Manhattan Project was named after. Why did they pull the name of a, a big island in New York City uh, out of the sky to, to title I believe it had something, something to do that, with Columbia Uni University. Something that created the, uh, the atomic bomb. No, it was because uh, they got all the funding from uh, Bernard Baruch. Right. The fellow who controlled Wall Street in those days. Right. And at that time, Washington, D.C. didn't have enough money that they needed to uh, get the Manhattan Project done. And that's why they turned to Wall Street. Yep. Go if ahead. I can interject briefly, I just came across a Black Flag Power provided a demo on January 28th, uh, 2014. You can view the entire demo uh, given by uh, Randall Lee Mills. Uh, it's on YouTube. And essentially what he's showing is that water can be converted into a plasma, and then the plasma can be uh, sparked, uh, and it, it's a very powerful explosion. Now, it doesn't take, it doesn't take much of an idea to understand that you could use this power to power motors, generators, uh, and it can be done uh, on a macro level and on a micro level. It can be done in power plants or it can be done in individual plants in your home. And this technology, we could have had it 10 years ago, but it was suppressed. I wrote well, a piece. His, history is, is just full of, of technologies that, that had a, a spark of uh, credibility to it and yep. was kept from the necessary funding to bring it to completion. Right. So w without getting lost on a rabbit trail of, of a gazillion different inventions here, let's stay focused on the, the, the academic uh, kicking out of any new ideas. You, you brought that up in the, in the first show that novelty of fact was, uh, was impossible, that they had an agenda, they had a, a fixed academic list of rules that everything had to be followed, and in order for you to have the, the graduate degree, you had to follow those, uh, those points. The there, there was an article on the internet uh, recently I, I sent you on uh, uh, kind of blaming PhDs for bringing us into the, the energy uh, melee that we're in today, and that, that's so true. And we can blame it on academia. Academia turns out an agenda. They don't necessarily turn out intelligent people to be a benefit to society. No, they have an agenda they have to follow, and it's the people that fund the universities that create the, uh, the agenda. And so hence that's, the, that's what we're going into. the control here. paradigm. It's very yeah. important to understand that everything is covered under the control paradigm. We are not free here to have private inquiry. We're not free here to do our own due diligence because of the rigidity or I should say the orthodoxy or the dogma that's involved. I even have a page on dogma that you should look at. Most of my pages should be reviewed by people who are interested in understanding the nature of the problem. I took uh, great pains to uh, bring it together to show it, and essentially it's important for people to uh, see the, uh, the differences, the dichotomy that's involved. The, the problem is that the paradigm, the control paradigm, has already advanced way beyond all of this, and it has now permeated uh, our present situation, and that is highly complex, highly rigorous. The paradigm never does the same thing uh, uh, twice, and it always uh, has a new approach, a new dynamic, and something totally different than most people an can anticipate. Because the paradigm realizes that eventually uh, people will begin to recognize the fraud, They'll be able to recognize the, uh, the deception, and they'll be able to get out from under it. But the paradigm is comprised of very intelligent personages who understand how to uh, create uh, a Hegelian dialectic in such a way that people cannot deviate from it. Uh, they create uh, a, a division, so to speak, which is what the Hegelian dialectic is all about. It's interesting that uh, the, year Hegel, the year after Hegel died in that, 1831, the uh, Russell Trust Association was founded in 1832 by William Huntington Russell, Russell and Alfonso Taft, the progenitor of the Taft family. An important book that needs to be looked at is Anthony Sutton's The Federal Reserve Conspiracy. The reason why it's important, because it gives you a perspective that is not necessarily understood unless you go back in time which is what history books are all about. They're actually time capsules, and they reveal what took place in the past. 
And it's important to understand that the past is governed by the people who uh, were victorious, and therefore the victors control the information. Looking at the book right now as I'm flipping it up on the Internet, Sutton essentially has to show in time how the entire system evolved, how it developed. And looking at the uh, list, you can see that uh, uh, he begins with the Banker's Bank. He begins with Thomas Jefferson and the money power, Andrew Jackson, the last uh, elite anti-elitist uh, president. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but Thomas Jefferson was against central banks. He did not want it to uh, become prevalent. Andrew Jackson basically destroyed the second central bank of the United States. In fact, he was the only president to actually pay off the debt. Then uh, you have Roosevelt's Socialist Manifesto, and then you have Karl Marx and his manifesto. And then he refers to the money trust, and then he also refers to the uh, Jekyll Island conspiracy. These yeah, books we... have to be read. They, can, they cannot be discussed because they're too involved. And unfortunately, I don't have the ability to, or the time, to go deep into any of these topics. They have to be read by people who are seriously inv interested in the subject matter and are willing to pursue it and take it further. I wish I could be better. Uh, uh, well, one uh, one name in particular f flew by a few minutes ago in in, uh, in your comments, and we need to take a, a minute for you to elaborate on it. Now, granted, it could be a whole show in itself, but that's the Council on Foreign Relations, because uh, whenever you, one hears that name, the, the first thought is, oh, that's just a think tank in New York and a bunch of highbrow uh, intellectuals uh, bounce ideas around on, on national policy, and uh, that's all they are. No, that's not. Council on Foreign Relations was created with an agenda, and unless you, you, I'm sure you know more details than I do, but uh, you find way too many people in any administration belong to the CFR, and they march lockstep with what the CFR tells them. And there's a reason for that. No matter which political party they're in, they're getting orders. And who controls the CFR, Les? The CFR was founded by the Rockefeller family, and it was essentially to control uh, the, the people who, who uh, had the reins of power, specifically presidents. Uh, from the CFR, uh, uh, the president uh, chose advisors. He was uh, he was not allowed to uh, select his own advisors. Advisors were selected for him. Uh, this was finally revealed by Jimmy Carter, who, uh, ha who having a discussion with Pat Robertson one day uh, on TV, he revealed that he was unable to do what he wanted to accomplish. Well, I'm talking about uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter, as you know, when he wanted to become president, he was the governor of Georgia. He was a peanut farmer as well, so he was his hands firmly grounded in the ground, so to speak. Uh, when he wanted to become president, he went to David Rockefeller, and he expressed to David Rockefeller his intent to uh, become president, and David Rockefeller conceded to it. He conceded. He, he allowed it. He essentially surrounded uh, Jimmy Carter with advisors uh, from the CFR, and they essentially controlled Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was not able to do what he wanted to do. And that is why uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, presidency was not the best uh, that there should have been. Under Jimmy Carter, we had high interest rates. We had significant inflation. And it took the succeeding presidency to bring it back to normal. We're talking about Reagan, of course. None of the presidents that are in power have their own ability to do what they want to do. This was exemplified by the uh, assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, this was exemplified by uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, when Nixon uh, wanted to do things differently, he was basically outed, ousted and forced out of office. Uh, he, <laughs> he was, it was revealed by Alexander Butterfield at the Nixon hearings that uh, there were tapes that were ongoing continuously that revealed uh, uh, what uh, Nixon was doing. And so Nixon could not hide his actions or activity because they were being independently uh, uh, recorded without his control or say-so. That was an interesting revelation in and of itself.
Yeah, so the point I have to stress here is we are bringing up all these geopolitical issues here on the show. Why? Can I have to ask the question, okay, Ken, this, is, uh, this show is about energy. What, what, what do these things have to do? Look again. We, Les just pointed out CFR was founded by Rockefeller. Who made Rockefeller rich? He started the whole oil industry. So we now see the oil industry original roots are controlling every administration in government we've had since the turn of the 1900s into the end of uh, <laughs> the 21st century. Uh, this is uh, this is outrageous to see who is pulling the strings, the financial strings, and controlling each administration, no matter which side of the aisle they sit on, has the same guys calling the shots. And this really does boil down into energy. And it's not just oil. Rockefeller uh, merged into uh, into controlling nuclear. He's got just as much control of nuclear as, as he does oil. And you put oil and nuclear together, that's, uh, that's what, 80% of the, of, of the world's power. Even more, when you looked at oil branches into natural gas, it's almost a lost cause when you come up with something in innovative that's truly clean well, look what you're going up against. It's, it's not just one corporation out there you're battling. It is, uh, it is the corporation with government. You're battling a, essentially a paradigm. You're, you're, yep. you're, you're battling a combination of influences that are working together to suppress information, to suppress knowledge. And uh, a discussion on the Obama administration would probably take 10 shows because yeah. what he has done and has accomplished has totally destroyed uh, this country. In fact, he was supported by Schumer. Schumer wanted to basically uh, stop us from uh, drilling for oil. And he, he, he essentially was one of the brains behind doing it. And he supports Obama because of what he, what Obama has done. Unfortunately, Schumer is dead wrong. Uh, Obama is wrong, and this country is headed to oblivion if we keep this up. Yeah. Well, I see our live feed is already shut off, so we're we're in overtime here. But the the show is still being recorded, so uh, let's go ahead and wrap up and take however much time you need to uh, summarize what you plan to go into on the next show. Yes, I intend to uh, finally uh, talk about the energy sy system that we could have. I intend to go into the view from force space and explain why uh, – uh, it is significant, and I also intend to explain uh, the, the significant participation that I played in uh, building a 30-core monopole system and having it revealed that it actually did incorporate Dirac, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and it is real, it does work, that James Clerk Maxwell did discover that you could extract energy uh, from a uh, four spatial uh, environment. That's why he called them the 20 unknowns. And unfortunately, the people that came after him didn't understand that, and they simplified the equations. The point being that the, the equations that are commonly referred to as Maxwell's equations are not his equations. They are Heaviside's equations. And I intend to go into that and explain that. Uh, the one man that uncovered all of this was Thomas Eugene Bearden at Huntsville, Alabama. He was uh, involved with uh, rockets, and uh, he basically he went to a library at that time, a military library that had all of this information from way back when. Unfortunately, the people that took over uh, when he left were the helicopter people. He called them the chopper group. They threw all of that out. They thought that was garbage, nonsense, ah, it's old hat. They threw it all out, so all that information is, is gone. Uh, fortunately, uh, uh, Tom Bearden uh, uncovered the information before that happened, and he was able to uh, come up with the data that he, he gave me and the information that he provided. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you, Les. Thank you for uh, this, uh, once again, excellent exposure to, uh, to the research you've done on the, uh, the writings of Anthony Sutton. And uh, Les and I have both uh, talked with, with many inventors, and we've, we've witnessed some pretty amazing stuff ourselves, uh, which is why we, we go into this. And all too often we find 
very intelligent, well-meaning inventors get something work. A few of them don't measure it right, and they kind of drop by the wayside. But a lot of them did have their measurements right. They just didn't have the funding to take it on to the next step, nor did they get any respect when government and academia comes in. And so we're constantly battling agendas against us. So uh, on goes the battle, and I'm going to continue to, uh, if we can get, fi- get funding on uh, on this uh, on our own program here, we'll uh, we'll continue to delve into this product and try to get some some clean energy out to uh, out to everybody. So you can buy it off the shelf at, at Walmart or Home Depot or AutoZone or wherever you shop at. So uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today, and uh, we'll see you on the next show. Bye for now. Thanks, Ken.